Amen. You guys can have a seat. Isn't that so true? He is good. Woo. And that song is going to be stuck in your head for the rest of today. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Pastor Will, and I get to do a little message for our kids in the room. So where are my City Line kids at? Where are my City Line kids at? Raise those hands high. Come on. I know you're in here and online. I know there's some of you watching there, too. So you guys, this is a little different, right? This is a little different. You're up here. You're worshiping with us. We're about to learn about the Lord where usually you'd be downstairs worshiping and learning about the Lord. And as your pastor, it's always, it's always my goal to teach you just a little bit more each time about who God is. Who God is. And we're going to be talking about God's attributes. Now that might be a new word. Attributes. So let's say that together on the count of three. One two, three. Everybody, attributes. That's right. God's attributes. Now, before we get into that, I know so many of you guys. I know so many of you, and you guys are so kind. So many of you, when you see me, you're like, what's up, Pastor Will? How are you? How was your Christmas? And you, you just show me that you care for me, and you're so kind. And others of you, you're so funny, and you're always cracking jokes. Eva, always cracking jokes, putting smiles on other people's faces, and you're so funny. And others of you, you're so hardworking, and you're never giving up at the thing that you want to get good at. You're so hardworking. And now those things, those kind of make up who you are, right? Those are what we call your attributes. Those are your attributes. Say that with me. Attributes. Yes. So God also has attributes. He has so many attributes. I wish we could talk about them all today, but we only have time for a little bit. So I'm going to pull out some sand, and each jar of sand represents one of his attributes. So we're going to get into God's attributes right now. And the first one I really want to talk about is how God is eternal. God is eternal. He was from the very beginning. In the beginning was God. And guess what? He's not going anywhere. He's going to be here forever, and someday we will be able to live with him in eternity. And because God is eternal, I can have hope. Because God is eternal, I can have hope. He's fully eternal. Isn't that beautiful? And God, he's also holy. God is holy. He's what we call set apart. He has never sinned. He's not like you and me where sometimes we struggle with that. But he is holy. He's clean. He's perfect. And because God is holy, fully holy, I can worship him. I can worship a holy God. You can worship a holy God. We don't worship anybody else, but we worship the holy God. And God is also fully truth. Jesus says himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Isn't that beautiful? He is the truth. He is all we really need to know. Everything we need to know about him and about living this life is right here in his word because it's true and we can trust him. God is true, truth, and we can trust him. Beautiful. And God is also a judge. God is the judge. He says what's right and what's wrong. He gives the consequences to what's right and what's wrong. And so because he's the judge, I can obey him. He is fully judge. Look at that. We have a few of his attributes there. And the final one we're going to talk about is how God is love. God is love, and he loves you so much that he would give his only son, Jesus, for you so that you can live with him in eternity. He loves you, and he is the perfect representation of love. And so we can share that with everybody else. God is love, and I can share his love with others. Now, this is our beautiful God with just a few of his attributes. If we got into all of his attributes, this jar would be overflowing. We would be up to our knees in sand in this room. Perfect mix. 
lacking nothing. This is our amazing God. And we are in his family. We're in the family of Jesus Christ. And this family is a family that has hope. This family is a family that can worship him, the holy God. This is a family that can trust him. This is a family that can obey him and a family that can share his love. Isn't that beautiful? This is our God. And we actually have an amazing story right now of one of our own students here at City Line. And I'm going to invite her up. Her name is Ellie. And Ellie's going to be coming to the stage. She's going to be telling us a little bit about how she's going to be serving this amazing God of ours. So welcome, Ellie, to the stage. <laughs> welcome, Ellie. So, Ellie, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what the Lord's been doing in your life in the past years and what you're off to next. Hi, my name is Ellie Scalero, and I'm a senior here at City Line Students. Um, so, a little bit about myself. I grew up in a Christian home with parents who love the Lord, and I grew up in the church, but I didn't really understand what it meant to be a Christian until the end of my eighth grade year. Um, I had the opportunity to come to City Line at the end of my eighth grade year, and I got plugged in right away, and I had the opportunity to go to Camp Harvest. Um, if you don't know a lot about camp, the third night is Salvation Night. And um, the preacher got up there and he said, sin enslaves you and you can never beat sin on your own. And that's why we need a savior and you need to give your life to the Lord. Um, and that really convicted me. Um, and I got to rededicate my life to the Lord that night. And since then, um, it's been a journey, but I started finding my identity in Christ instead of finding my identity in volleyball, which I was really committed to, and getting affirmation from others. Um, and then last year, I got diagnosed with Lyme disease, and this kind of stripped all of the things I was finding my identity in other than Christ away. So I qu had to quit volleyball, and I had to switch to online school, and this really taught me to find my identity in the Lord, and that was the only thing that was going to be fulfilling. And so um, since I switched to online school, I had the opportunity to graduate high school a semester early. So I just graduated high school a few weeks ago, and so this opened up a semester uh, between high school and college for me. So I have the opportunity to do a six-month missions trip uh, through the organization called YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And so next week, I will be leaving for Kona, Hawaii uh, to do discipleship training training school. So through Discipleship Training School, I'll be diving deeper into the Bible and learning how to spread the gospel effectively. Um, and then the next three months will be overseas somewhere. The location is unknown at the moment, and we'll be putting to practice all the things we learned in Discipleship Training School. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Amen. So... Uh, as Pastor Ken mentioned earlier, we really want to get behind and support uh, the people in our church that, are, that have the heart for missions and want to go out and make disciples uh, in other countries. And so, Ellie, we want to do that for you as well. So how can we pray for you and support you? Next yeah, um, prayer is powerful, and I would just love prayer. Uh, just for my health the next few weeks, I need to get tested for COVID right before I fly, so um, that that will come back negative, so I'm able to get on the flight, um, and also for safe travels. Um, and then also a lot of international students are having troubles keeping their flights because they keep getting canceled because borders are closing. So um, just that they can find a flight in order to come. And then also just support raising. I'm about 1,500 away from my goal so that I can get there um, to be able to go. Awesome. Awesome. So why don't we go ahead and take some time to pray for Ellie. So if you want to go ahead and reach an arm out towards Ellie and we're going to cover her in prayer right now. Lord, we thank you that you are this amazing God that we just talked about with all of your beautiful attributes, not lacking in anything good. And we thank you for the ways that we can serve you, the ways that we can worship you. And we thank you for Ellie as she's taking this step out in faith, in you, trusting fully that you are going to use her, that you're going to use her to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And we trust you with that too, Lord. We ask for protection over Ellie in this next season of life, that she would continue to keep her eyes on you, that she would feel so supported and loved here in prayer, that we would just get behind her knowing that you are bringing her just closer to yourself and, and working through her and using her in the lives of so many uh, out wherever you're going to bring her. So, Lord, we lift up Ellie. We thank you for 
for her in this time. And God, we thank you for this worship service. Would you continue to bless it? And would you be glorified through it all? I pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ellie. Amen. So now for our City Line kids, uh, this is where we dismiss you. If you already checked in, you can, all the City Line kids could just head right back there. We got our workers back there for, for you to meet. And then uh, parents, if you didn't check them in already, you could take them back there as well. And now we're going to invite Pastor John to uh, bring us God's word. You need this mic, don't you? That's so great. Welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing? That's great. It's so good to um, celebrate the last weekend of 2020 together as a family. Having our kids here, making a cameo appearance in a music video. I got to check that box off this weekend while we were singing I'm Trusting You. There was a handsome young man that just floated across the stage with grace and style. It's so great having the kids here. I really look forward to um, next year when we have more weekends like this. It's so great. We got together as a family that we worship as a family, that we open up God's word as a family, that we talk about the Lord together as a family, that the kids are up here. Uh, you don't know the impact that it makes, but those are the seeds that get planted, that get remembered for years to come. And God uses these moments to bring back to their remembrance their connection with him and how we get to facilitate, cultivate, and be a part of that experience. That is such a great thing. Um, I love the fact that this is a family weekend um, because that's what we're going to talk about today. So it makes my job a little bit easier. That's a little bit more of a selfish uh, point, but it makes my job just a little bit easier. The title of today's message is simply we are family. We are family. And I can't help but say that phrase and not have the song trigger in my head, you know. We are family. And I'm not going to sing any more of it. We're, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. But we're going to spend our time in the book of Ephesians where the Apostle Paul uh, talks about uh, family and we're going to unpack what that means and us becoming the family that God wants us to be. Our key verses for today are going to be Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 through 22. So if you have your Bibles, uh, both physical or digital, I'd like to encourage you to turn there and we'll have that on the screens as well. This is Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 through 22 and it says this, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And we're going to unpack these four verses and uh, really grab together the truth of God's word to help us become the family that God longs for us to be. But first, let's pray uh, for our time in the word. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, Father, would you open our hearts? And God, would you open our understanding? Search our hearts, oh God, and lead us into your truth. God, would you break down any walls that we may have put up? Would you shine your light, oh Father, and expose anything in us that's not like you? Because we want to walk in the light as you are in the light. And so, Lord, we, we ask that you would lead us in your truth and, and that you would lead us in your way, that we would leave differently than the way we came in. I pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, 
We live in a day and age where uh, technology is moving at such a fast rate. And by the time we buy a gadget or gizmo and we figure out how to use it and everything that it does, by the time we figure all of that out, it's obsolete. And something new is on the market that replaces that and works completely differently. Now, for myself, I find myself pretty tech savvy when it comes to new technologies coming out and doing all the tech stuff. That's kind of uh, part of who I am. But there are some technological advances I feel sometimes are not necessary. And I feel that they're not necessary because I have a little trouble with them. One piece of technology in particular are faucets. I said it, faucets. Um, I believe that the original design for a faucet, you know, uh, two knobs, one for cold, one for hot, turn and it comes out, was perfect. No reason for changing it. But the problem that I happen to run into every time I meet a new fangled faucet, an updated new technological wonder, is the fact that there are no knobs. Uh, some of these new faucets, they don't have any knobs. They'll have a stick where you have to pull or push or twist or turn or do something. And some of them don't even have the stick. Some of them you kind of just touch and the water comes out. Now, how you change the temperature on that, that's another story. But for me, I get a little frustrated if I can't figure it out in the first 30 seconds. Confession time. Now, that's a very silly example, but the principle of this very true example is the fact that um, my opinion based on how I feel or think a faucet should work or function will determine my interaction with it. And this boils over into our everyday lives. Uh, we all carry opinions and thoughts uh, about things that we experience. And depending on what our perspective or opinion is on such matter will determine whether we interact or connect or not with any such thing. And one of those things includes the church. The church has been around for a very long time, and depending on how each of us grew up, we all have a different perspective of the church, and we all carry different opinions on how we feel the church should run, what it should look like, how it should operate, etc. And depending on how, what our perspectives are, well, that's going to determine how we connect or interact with the church. And so... The problem has a very easy solution. You see, my frustration with the faucet is not so much that the faucet is different. The problem is not the design. The problem is my understanding of how it works. My frustration is very easily fixed when I now understand how it works. And I can do that by going to the manual. When it comes to the church... The church is not man-designed. It's God-designed. It's God-created. It's God-established. And so we know, if we know anything about God, we know that God is perfect. And so his design is flawless. The, the problem is not on the designer's part. It's on the user's part. And we are notorious from the beginning of time, from Adam and Eve in the garden all the way to right now, we are pretty notorious, humanity, for taking the things that God gives us and misusing it or using it in a way that was never intended. And so as we start to approach this topic of being a family or being a church or, or whatever it is, we're going to have to use a little bit of humility and maybe put aside what we think or how we feel so that we can go to the manual and see how it's supposed to operate. And hopefully that brings us a little bit closer to what God intended in the first place when he established the church. Amen? Amen. And so we start with uh, uh, one of the things that separates 
uh, Christianity from all other religions in the world is that, well, Christianity is not a religion. Now, the world and the world system needs to categorize things in order to understand it. So they've taken Christianity and they've lumped it in along with all the other religions of the world. But us as believers, we need to have an understanding of something. That Jesus didn't come into the world to establish a religion. He came to restore relationship. He came to restore the relationship that was broken in the garden with Adam and Eve. Jesus came to be the way. He came to be the truth. He came to be the life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is our uh, propitiation for our sins. He's our atonement. Jesus paid for our sins. Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is our redemption. All so that relationship could be restored between God and man. And when we talk about redemption, we're talking about a price being paid and taking something or someone from some place and bringing them to another. And in the context of Christ, our Savior, he paid the ultimate price with his life to bring us from death to life, from Satan to God, from sin to righteousness, from our will to his. And this whole process of redemption happens when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And last weekend, Pastor Jason did such an amazing job walking us through this whole process where we go from death to life. We become saved. But that's just the beginning. See, God doesn't leave us there as just a saved individual. See, each one of us have to go to go through that process ourselves. There's no group confession where we all do that. No, each one of us have to make a personal decision to make this confession and own this belief in our heart. But God doesn't leave us as individuals. No, he takes us and then he puts us in a community of other believers, of other redeemed. And that is where the family begins to form. You start to see it, we're going to start digging a little bit deeper, and this is going to lead to our first point. We are family by the plan of God. We are family by the plan of God. We're going to look back at verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, Paul is writing this letter to the believers in Ephesus. The book of Ephesians is six chapters long. The first three chapters, Paul talks strictly about the doctrine and theology of the church. And then in the last three chapters, he gives the application on how the church is to operate and function and what our relationships should look like. Now, this can be applied both individually and corporately together as a church. But in this particular verse from chapter 2, Paul is giving instruction and insight to the believers in Ephesus that there is no longer any distinction between Jew and Gentile in Christ. Now, this was a very hot-button topic back in the day. You see, back in the Old Testament, God was exclusively the God of the Israelites, one people group. He was their God, and they were his people. And he showed himself mighty on behalf of the Israelites. 
and the other nations would view the mighty acts of God and they would fear and they would come to this place where they realize that the God of Israel is the true and living God. But in the New Testament, God continues to push forward his plan through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. See, Christ goes to the cross, he sacrifices his life, and he brings for us salvation. But it's not just salvation for Israel, it is salvation for all. And this is where we get John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, we all know that. So God is no longer just the God of Israel, but now he is the God and Father to all who believe. And we read that last week from John chapter 1. To those who believe, he gave the right to become children of God. And this is how the family starts to get formed. Now it's not just for Israel, but for all people. Salvation is for anyone. It is the invitation for anyone, all of humanity, to come and believe and submit their lives to the Lord and allow him to be their Savior and their Lord. That is a beautiful thing, and that is good news. This was God's plan the entire time. Salvation for all. So Paul's instruction to the Ephesians was letting them know that the Gentile believers had equal status with the, Jew, with the Jewish believers. That there was no distinction. They were equal. There was no difference. It's not like, all right, listen, you know, uh, you know, I'm saved and you're saved, but, you know, like, I have the premium package on salvation, so, like, I'm saved plus. You know, like, there's no hierarchy when it comes to salvation. Well, you know, I've, I've been saved longer, and, you know, I have a, a longer heritage in salvation. No, 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 no. Paul is wiping all of that out. He says, no, we are all together as one, and they are being joined into the family with equal status. And that's such a beautiful thing. And we see this in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says it like this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before. For the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is a continuum. This is part of God's plan. It wasn't an afterthought. God continued to unfold his plan through Jesus Christ, bringing salvation to all. Paul is saying God made a choice. He chose us long before we chose him. And in him, along with that choice, he gives his purpose. And he gives his plan. So he has things for us to do. It's not random. It's not by accident. This is a continuum in the faith. And this includes us. Come on, let's read Ephesians chapter 2 one more time. Let's look at that verse. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You see, when we come to believe, we're not creating a fresh, brand new relationship with God. No, we are joining in with what God has already established from the beginning. We are joining in. We are adopted into the family of the saints. We are joining into the church that God has established long before any of us got here. 
as an example, you know, from time to time, we give the history of our church. Right? We are City Line Bible Church. That's who we are. But we didn't start anything. A matter of fact, we have a little bit of history. If you go back to 1871, there was a church in the city of Chicago. It was called North Church. And that church had a community of believers, but that church burned down in the great Chicago fire. And some years later, that community of believers got together and rebuilt the building. And in 1888, anybody around from 1888? No. Belden Baptist Church was birthed. That community of believers continued to serve the Lord and be a light in their community. And during the 1970s, they moved from Chicago right here, where we are, this building. They built this building and cre created a church right here in this community. And as time went on, this community continued to grow and be a light in this neighborhood. And it's a year ago, you know, through some renovation, that City Line Bible Church came to be. But we didn't start fresh. No, we actually received the baton from all of those believers that began to build this community. We're here not starting something fresh but standing on the shoulders of those that have gone on before us that prayed for this area. That evangelized in this area, they endured, they sacrificed. Believers that we don't even know this side of heaven. But this is a continuum. We are carrying the torch. And it's the same when we come to believe. It's not starting something new, but it's receiving and carrying the torch of what God has established long ago. And that is a high honor that we would continue to carry that torch, carry the gospel of Jesus Christ, to shine the light of Christ in our community and in our homes. And this is not by chance. We are alive today to fulfill the purpose and the plan of God. And part of that purpose is community and relationship. He established it. The church advances his kingdom in the earth. And the church also facilitates our growth as his children. That we would mature. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. We're all connected. And this is part of God's plan for us. To live in community. To be known and to grow mature in Christ. And this leads us to our second point. We are family through the revelation of Christ. We are family through the revelation of Christ. Let's look at verses 20 and 21 together. It says, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus gathers his disciples and he has this conversation. At this point, Jesus' ministry has kind of taken off. He's done a bunch of miracles. He's traveled from town to town. And people were, there was a buzz. People were anticipating where's Jesus going to show up next. And there's this buzz around Jesus. And so he gathers his disciples and he asks his disciples a couple questions. He asks them first, well, who do the people say that I am? And the disciples answer, oh, well, you know, some people are saying, you're John the Baptist. Uh, other people are saying, you're Elijah. Some people are saying, you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asks, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter jumps up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' reply to Peter is found here in Matthew 16, verses 17 and 18. It says, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, 
You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I love this. Peter's declaration grants him a new name. His declaration is the same declaration as the household of faith. Because what is the church made of? Of a bunch of believers that have declared that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're right. He said, you are Peter. He gives him somewhat of a name change. And in Greek, Peter is Petros. It's the masculine text, the tense of the word. It also means a stone. It means one singular stone, a stone that you can carry, a stone that you can throw. Petros. And then he goes on to say, and on this rock I will build my church. But the word rock that he uses, I love this because Jesus did a little bit of wordplay. And if you don't catch it, sometimes it's like, man, that kind of just went over my head. He doesn't use the same word for rock. He says Petra, which is the female tense of the word, which I thought was just amazing because now he's referring to how he's building his church. And you know the church is the bride of Christ. But Petra is also plural. And it means a mountain made of many stones. It's a rock formation made of many stones. And Jesus is giving a picture of what the church would look like and how he's building the church. He's not building the church on one singular stone, but on many. And Peter got it. Because later on, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. He writes this. He says, as you come to him, meaning Jesus... A living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do you see it? The formation of the church coming around with Jesus as the cornerstone and everyone else being built around him. This is not just for a few, but this includes all of us. Like I said, it's not an accident. It's not random. But we are saved for here, this generation to fulfill God's purpose and plan to where we are, right here, right now. The giftings, the, the talents, the abilities that God has placed in each and every one of them used for his glory and the advancement of his kingdom. What a beautiful thing. When we become believers, we join in with the heritage of believers that God has established. We become living stones part of that mountain, part of the formation of the church that Christ is building. Not just simply ourselves, but with the saints of old. And that's such a beautiful thing. So let's see that verse again. Ephesians chapter 2, 20 and 21. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And Paul uses this word temple. And that would give such a great connotation because back in the day, Old Testament, New Testament, the temple was where you can find God's presence. That's where the presence of God would dwell. And that's the goal. That God's presence would dwell. When the saints gather together, when the believers gather together, that we would connect with the presence of God. But it's not just corporately because we know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we carry God's presence wherever we go. What a beautiful, powerful thing. He says we're being built into a holy temple in 
the Lord. And that's also a very powerful thing because he makes a distinction. Now, we've talked about salvation, but Lord, well, Lord is a title. It's connected to a position, a position of power. And when we allow Christ to be the Lord of our lives, well, a couple things need to happen. Well, we release control and we allow him to control. We, we don't call the shots. We're not the shot callers in our lives any longer. But we accept the invitation to be led. To be led by him. It's so amazing. We just heard Ellie's testimony and it's, she's going off to a missions trip. And if you would have asked her a couple of years ago, this was never on her radar. It would, would it have been something that she would have chosen. I mean, the focus of her life was volleyball. And there were probably some great aspirations there of becoming some great volleyball, amazing star. But it's amazing when you follow the path of the Lord, how he'll lead you down and into places that we never thought we would do opportunities that we would never think that we would ever have and places we never thought we would go. And that's such a beautiful thing. And this is, we're going to go to our last point. We are family by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the last verse in our key verses for today. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, we've already talked about how uh, we carry the presence of God wherever we go. And that the goal is to, for, to, for us to be a dwelling place for the presence of God. And so... Paul has kind of given a lot of information, just kind of like how I've given a lot of information today. Hopefully this is helpful information and it connects. But I could just imagine how the Ephesians are like, okay, great. I get it. Cool. Uh, this is God's plan the whole time. I'm with it. Salvation for everybody. And in order to bring salvation to everybody, he sends his son, Jesus. And he dies on the cross, and he purchases for us salvation. And now we can accept him and receive him. And all right, that's great. So how do we get this thing going? Um, I'm saved. You're saved. Do we just get into a room together? Do we just get a whole bunch of believers in a room together, and all of a sudden we click, and we're in harmony, and we're connected, and we could be the church? Anyone? No? No? That's not how it works. We, we can't just get a whole bunch of Christians together and everything just works. Oh, wouldn't that be lovely? I guess we'll save that for the movies. No. Paul begins to explain in the book of Ephesians. He goes from chapters 1, 2, and 3, giving doctrine and theology of the church. And he pivots in chapter 4 and he says this. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I love this piece of scripture. I love the book of Ephesians. Such, such a great book. So, so good. But I love this because let's just leave this, let's just leave this up here for a second. We're, we're going to continue to look at this. Because in here, what I see is a recipe. I like to cook. So I, I think of a lot of things in the context of food. Um, you're just going to have to love me that way. That's just who I am. But I see a recipe because Paul is giving us a bunch of ingredients to how we could become the family that God longs for us to be. And some of those ingredients are right here. Uh, humility and gentleness, patience. 
one of my favorites, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And like any recipe, you can't just have the ingredients list. You need to have the amount. I don't know if you've ever done this, um, but I have. I've been guilty of this. Uh, using tablespoons of salt instead of teaspoons of salt. That makes a major difference, guys. Yeah. It's like, man, I, I followed the, oh, yeah, I, I got that mixed up. You need the right amount of each ingredient. And Paul gives us the right amount. He says, verse 2, with all, <laughs> that's a lot, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. That's a lot. This ingredients list, you can't just buy at a store. That would be really great. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I would probably put this on my Amazon wish list and just get it to me, deliver it to me every week or so, just to stay stocked. But what Paul is getting at with this whole list is the crux of this whole message. That while we can understand God's plan, and while we could receive the salvation of Christ, we cannot do this apart from the Holy Spirit. You can understand so much of the past and how God has operated and what he planned for humanity. But without the work of the Holy Spirit in us, we cannot do it. These are all the things that the Spirit of God wants to work in each of us. Humility and gentleness, patience, love, peace. It all comes from the Spirit. This is not something we can manufacture or conjure up. There's no strategy meeting that we could have to be like, hey, okay, listen. We're going to be more gentle, okay? Everybody from now on, we're more gentle. It doesn't work that way. Unless the Holy Spirit works this in our hearts, we can't measure up to the amount of gentleness that we need in order to be the family that God longs for us to be. We can't measure up to any of these ingredients without the Holy Spirit working this in us, completing his work in us so that we can be the community, the family that he wants us to be. I want you to notice a couple of things. He says, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. Now, depending on the translation that you have, it might say be eager to preserve the unity of the spirit or keep the unity of the spirit. But that's possessive. It means that unity belongs to the spirit. That unity is a spiritual thing. It's not something that magically happens, but it's something that the Holy Spirit gives us. And our responsibility is to maintain it. To preserve it. To keep it. To steward it among us. And we can only do that when we're operating in humility, gentleness, patience, love, and peace. We have an on-off switch. We're either operating in the spirit or we're operating in the flesh. No in between. So in order to make this happen, we have to keep in step with the spirit. And just to break it down just a little bit, we have the flesh, right? The flesh is our own understanding, our own reasoning. Our own opinions, our own perspective, our own way. We are really good at that because that's what comes natural. Well, the spirit is opposite. It's God's perspective, God's way, God's purpose, God's plan, God's method. It's him. So we're either walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh. Galatians 5. Verses 16 through 18 says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, 
and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led, mm, what a good word, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. You see, wherever there is a lack of unity, there is a lack of keeping. There's not the right amount of humility and gentleness and patience and love and peace. Wherever there is no unity, that means the Spirit of God is not having his way because unity is what he supplies. The world makes an attempt at unity, and it's called tolerance. I'll put up with you. I'll tolerate you. I, I won't say anything. I don't want to rock the boat. Because if I rock the boat, then there's going to be conflict. And if there's conflict, there's no peace. But if I don't say anything, then there's no conflict. And we have peace, right? Even though on the inside, I really don't like when you do that, say that, when this happens. That's false peace. That is not what God is asking or wanting for the family of God. The world likes it because it wants to do its own thing without any accountability. See, I'm not going to call you on your stuff, so don't call me on my stuff, you know? So you do your thing, and I'll do my thing without any regard for anybody else and with no change. But that's how the world operates. And if we're not careful, we can bring that type of Unity, that type of peace into the church. That's not what God wants. That's not how he's designed it to be. That is not his original intention. Within that chapter, verse 15, he says, speak the truth in love. In love. But not, not, not your love. The love that the Holy Spirit supplies. You see, this is all part of God's plan. And depending on your perspective of the church, depending on your perspective of family, you will either connect or stay away. It's too much to deal with other people. Or I don't like when those things happen. And the further away that we get from God's design, the less we experience the things he intended to bring us. And we don't mature to the fullness that God wants and longs for each of us. Being a family is hard work. It's not instant. And God has brought us together to be a family. To bear with one another in love means I'm going to have plenty of opportunities to bear with you in love. That means somebody's going to do something I don't like, say something I don't like. But we need a level of commitment because that's what, that's what family that's what family is, through thick and thin. That's what a healthy family, that's what God's design family is. That even though we, we might bump up, together, bump up against each other sometimes, and even though some things might happen that we don't like or prefer, that we would still work through it because you are my brother and my sister. And it was God that brought us together. It's not instant. It takes time. And so this word is not a word of looking back and saying, oh, look how we messed up. or blah, blah. No, it's looking forward. Being like, you know what? I want to walk more in step with the Spirit. I, Lord, would you increase my humility? 
God, would you increase my, gen- my gentleness, my, my patience, my, my bearing with my brother and my sister in love. And not my love, but your love. None of us have it right. But when we get together, we can look to the one that has it perfect as a family. Now, maybe it doesn't operate like this in your home, but in my home, uh, me and my wife, we often look at our kids our, our, and we're like, stop, stop, stop messing with your brother. Leave your sister alone. They don't always get along, but they're still family and they're still connected and we're still committed to one another in this new year. Let's commit to one another a little better. Let's connect in a greater way to the family that God has put us in. Let's move forward in love. And we can only do that with the help of the Holy Spirit at work in each and any, in every one of us. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you, you don't leave us to ourselves, but God, you've placed us in such a great community. A community, Lord, that brings us closer to you, that grows us, that challenges our hearts, that helps us and encourages us and supports us, that loves us. Father, would you work this into our heart in these upcoming Weeks and months and even years, Lord, that you would help us collectively become the family that you have designed, O Lord. Help us to grow in love for one another and for you. Help us to collectively be a lighthouse in this community, but also shine the light of Christ wherever we go. Help us not to disconnect from what you've created and established for our good. But Lord, work in our hearts, O oh Father, that we would keep our focus on you and that we would have an awareness of our brothers and our sisters around us and that we would grow in Christ together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to close our service, and I thought that this this is it, guys. This is the last service of 2020. And we're going to close it by observing the Lord's table together as a family. What a beautiful way to end the year. And so um, our ushers wanted to uh, get you a communion on your way in. If you did not receive one, simply raise your hand and the usher is going to come by. Raise them high so that they could see you and they're going to come by and they're going to get you a uh, communion. We have Brandon. He's going to sing a chorus or two. And while he's doing that, I just want us to take time. We're going to take this together in a few moments. On the top, there's a little wafer. And, of course, on the bottom is the juice. But Brandon's going to sing over us a chorus or two. And while he's doing that, I want us to reflect before the Lord. I want us to repent of any known sins that we can approach the Lord's table with clean hands and a pure heart. And then take it together as a family. Amen. Let's take that time right now.
Christ, my living hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the bread and the cup together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. The high price that was paid for us, oh God, our redemption, our salvation. So full and so free. Thank you, oh God, for the freedom that we found in you. Lord. Help us to walk in that freedom each and every day. Help us to remember the price that was paid. Help us to allow your Holy Spirit to complete his work in us. That we would be the family that you long for us to be. I pray that you would do something amazing in us in this upcoming year. And each year that we're together, Father, that you would grow us more and more like you. Bless our homes. Bless our marriages. God, bless our children. Bless our students, oh God. Bless our seniors, Father. Father, would you keep your hand of favor and blessing upon us. Your hand of per Provision and protection, O oh Lord, in this upcoming year. May you shine your, your light upon us, O oh Lord, and help us to represent you well everywhere that we go. In the strong and matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Love you, family. Go in the peace of the Lord.